you know, previous attempts of trying to find a simplified representation of the brain in that canonical neural computations project, it's just, you know, showing the limitations of that attempt that, you know, maybe the brain is just a lot more complicated than right. people had hoped for. It makes me think that there is something important about like how the nervous system is if you like an extreme version of something that living cells are doing anyway and it makes me it pushes me to be skeptical that you could replicate that kind of adaptive intelligence in a system that isn't made up of living cells This is Brain Inspired. Hey everyone, it's Paul. Today I was joined by Masrita Chiramuta, who is a neuroscientist turned philosopher of neuroscience and philosopher of science more broadly and a historian of neuroscience. She's been at the University of Pittsburgh for a few years, but is soon on her way to the University of Edinburgh, back closer to her original home. I found her through her recent work on this current dilemma we're facing, the growing divide between prediction and understanding. That is, we're building these deep learning models that produce impressively accurate predictions, while at the same time our understanding of how they compute those predictions is getting worse. She claims, for instance, that classic, simpler computational models in neuroscience, like receptive field models of early visual cortical neurons, that those canonical, simpler models, in an important sense, actually provide better understanding while also providing worse predictions. This is because, in her account of understanding, our understanding is never really about what's truly going on, the true nature of whatever we're trying to understand. But instead, it's always an abstraction, an idealization away from the truth. The disconnect from the truth does the useful work of making models more intelligible, more interpretable, and making anything uh, understandable. That's a simplification of her position, which she describes more clearly during our conversation. We also get into a bunch of her other work, like whether we should consider that brains at their heart are really carrying out computational functions. Or if that itself is a story that we tell ourselves when in reality, the computational properties can't be separated from all the other physiology and metabolism that we often think of as noise or something to control away uh, during our experiments. Go to braininspired.co to find the show notes with links to the relevant papers and some of the books that we mentioned. There's a handful of books recently on the topic of understanding. Plus, Masrita, uh, a few years ago, wrote a book all about color perception and what color really is. And we really briefly mention it during our conversation, but I encourage you to check it out because it's a really interesting proposition. Brain-inspired Patreon supporters get the full version of this episode and all episodes on their private feeds, where they also get occasional completely separate bonus episodes. So consider supporting the show if that sounds appealing. You won't hear me reading advertisements here, because that business model fundamentally disagrees with me personally, and I want to believe it isn't necessary. You can go to braininspired.co and find the red Patreon button there if you have similar beliefs. Thanks everyone for listening, and here's our conversation. Masrita, in the Cathedral of Learning, where your that's where your office is, right? That's right. Do, do you have a window in your office? Yes. Yeah. Uh, and do you know what direction that window faces? Uh, it faces towards downtown, which I suppose is west. Oh, okay, so so you're on the opposite side of the windows where you would be looking over the Mellon Institute, where I worked in the basement for years, and you know, the basement which would flood and which was fun because we'd have to rescue all the animals, you know, uh-huh. and save them and stuff. Right. Um, so anyway, you work in a, a beautiful building the Cathedral of Learning at the University of Pittsburgh for now, although 
you just told me you got a job. Uh, you're, you'll be transferring in August to Edinburgh University. So congrats on the new job. And uh, the Mellon Institute is also a beautiful building. And it's famous for, from the Batman movies. Oh, is that why it's famous? So it was famous for its large columns when I was there. And then then they filmed Batman there. <laughs> and I guess mm-hmm. it's famous for Batman. Right, right. right. Yeah. Oh, we could talk Pittsburgh for a long time. But right. <laughs> so, so I really uh, enjoyed reading your work. And I realize uh, it's partly because I have a philosophical bent, but also because it's philosophy that's very grounded in what I have done in the past. Mm-hmm. And it made me realize that philosophy by itself is one thing, but philosophy with knowledge of the (laughs) topics uh, Mm -hmm. that are being discussed, because you use examples from computational neuroscience in Mm -hmm. your philosophical discussions, it's much more enjoyable and and much more, you can just grasp onto it. So Mm -hmm. let me back up. You you were and still are a neuroscientist in some sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and made the switch to philosophy 10-ish years ago. Is that right? Right. Um, A bit longer, actually. So I got my first postdoc in philosophy back in 2005. I started, so 15 years ago now. But also my first degree um, was in philosophy. I did philosophy and psychology as my first degree. I see. So I had like a long-standing interest dare I say, passion for philosophy, sort of predating my switch back as a postdoc. I see. So you just dipped your toes in neuroscience <laughs> for many <laughs> right. years, actually. So, right, so right. your book, Outside Color, uh, which is about what color really is, and it combines the physical attributes of color with our perception of color, um, which we're actually not going to talk about today, but I recommend. Mm-hmm. Um, but it kind of followed your neuroscience uh, in many respects. Mm-hmm. And everything we'll talk about today is your expanding reach into various areas of uh, the philosophy of science and philosophy of neuroscience. Can I? Can you say the philosophy of neuroscience? Yes, sure. Let's call it the philosophy of neuroscience. <laughs> so, okay. So, two thousand and five is when you started transitioning to mm-hmm. philosophy. So, how was that transition? Well, how how do you mean? How was well, it? Well, I have the the feeling that. Um, hmm, let me rephrase this. Was it a joyful transition? Did, was Is philosophy mm-hmm. liberating to you or is it just as frustrating as the science and just as interesting? You know, ha, ha, you know what, are, what are the differences? Right, right. So I would say that definitely for a long time and still, still a bit today, I miss the sort of the laboratory work, that kind of investigation where you're just doing experiments and sort of finding out what's going on and and really sort of in touch with concrete things and also working in a collaboratory way. But I didn't doubt my decision to go into philosophy because I would say um, for reasons about how I am as a kind of academic, um, I have broad interests. I don't like to be over-specialized and to be a successful scientist today you have to be willing to really be very focused and specialized. You know, you have one kind of laboratory, which, you know, really digs into the nitty gritty of one kind of line of research. Whereas, you know, I, in philosophy, I, I can, you know, not only do philosophy of neuroscience, but philosophy of science more generally, working in areas around perception, which goes a bit into psychology as well. So just because I'm the kind of person that doesn't like to specialize, philosophy suits me a lot better. And I, I think this is a pretty fixed trait about me when I was at, um, when I was at high school. So in, in Britain, at the age of 16, you're supposed to decide whether you're a scientist or a humanities person. Yeah. And I, I refused to decide, like I did a mixture of A levels, you know, the high school exams from, humanities and science and then for my bachelor's degree I chose philosophy and psychology because again you could straddle the humanities and the sciences and still doing philosophy of science especially history and philosophy of science then it, again it, it allows you to straddle those different just refuse to fit in <laughs> right <laughs> so 
in in experimental science, as you know, you you know you seek to answer a single sort of question, and then let's say you do some experiments and you answer that question, or maybe you don't answer that. More likely, you actually don't answer that question.、Mm -hmm. But either way,、uh, that process, the end result is creating fifty more questions,、mm -hmm. and then you can kind of choose from those and move on. How do you decide what to explore next? Is it a similar sort of process? I would say so. I find that every paper I write has a concluding section, which is another paper that. Needs to be written.、Yeah. So, and often what happens is the first draft of a paper will have the final section, <laughs> which is a bit less coherent. But it's really like, okay, this is really what this current paper is telling us, but it needs to be much expanded upon. And then, in the version that gets published. I'll just say, okay, well, there's a question for another day, but really, it's bugging me that there's this other thing that then has to be developed further. So I would say my research pro projects now they kind of grow fairly organically. That I'll you know start on the thread and it will lead me to another thing and another thing.、Um, you know, in my job at Pittsburgh, I've had the luxury of not having to apply for grants,、mm. and so I could just you know work in a way that. Would follow the interests as opposed to having to say in advance what the research project would be, and then follow things according to that with set goals in advance. That really is very similar to experimental research because you you start with your question, and then you、uh, I, I'm going to figure out oh I don't know well V1 let's say right, and then you realize、mm -hmm. that、right. you don't understand. <laughs> You don't actually understand the neurons and how they're working. Do I、mm -hmm. need to understand that everything gets shifted and shifted and shifted until finally you're a heap of tears,、uh, but with some pub、right. published papers <laughs> along the way. <laughs> right. Yeah. You, you have so you're you've gone down down the philosophy track,、uh, but that's not all. I mean, your writing is steeped with、uh, history as well, and so and I know that history has. Really shaped your views、uh, about all of this. So, how has learning history,、uh, in addition to the philosophy, shaped your views? Yeah. So, so、um, with my job in Pittsburgh, because we're a his history and philosophy of science department, it means that we would have to teach、um, history classes periodically. So, I found that I really enjoyed reading into historical episodes in neuroscience, and then. As a philosopher, what I found about looking at historical cases is that the work is in the past. So, of course, there's always more that you can read about the past. But the science itself isn't a moving target in the way that contemporary science is. So, contemporary neuroscience is moving so fast. There's so many things <laughs> coming out all the time. It's just crazy. Since the time that I was studying. Neuroscience PhD student at the turn of the millennium, ages ago. Yeah, yeah. It is now just theoretically,、um, uh, methodologically, such a different field. Whereas, if I take a episode from the neuroscience of the past, at least that is something which is not still undergoing change. Of course, my ideas about it will change if I investigate it further and learn, learn more about it. But at least the science itself is not a moving target. In the same way, so so for my current book project, I just、uh, recently got a contract with MIT Press. It's、um, the working title is "How to Simplify the Brain," and it's about abstraction and idealization in theoretical neuroscience.、Um, but a few of the case studies will be on what I think of as the first. Cohesive doctrine in theoretical neuroscience, which was the reflex theory of the、mm -hmm. late nineteenth late nineteenth century, early twentieth century, and、um, just digging into that, looking at the ways that scientists back then attempted to simplify the brain by thinking of the brain as just operating by this set of concatenated reflexes. In retrospect, we can look at that and think of it. Well, that's rather oversimplified. But from you can also, as a historian, think about that science from the researchers' perspective and look at why that made sense for them to make those 
assumptions and follow those practices that they did. And hopefully, you know, looking at that historical episode of a science which is now obsolete, there'll be some lessons also for today mm. about like, the motivations of simplification and also perhaps the limitations. That's hard. That's that's a hard job to to apply that lesson to whatever's going on currently. We're mm-hmm. always kind of blind right. to what's happening happening right. currently. Mm-hmm. What, well, also back then, and I'm you, know, <laughs> you may or may not know this, but back then they mm-hmm. knew less about brains. <laughs> So they right. actually had less to go on, right? And that's probably sure, a lot of sure. what your book is about. Right. Um, sure. you know, I have an int- interesting subtitle for your book. I'll get to in a little bit here. We'll see. Mm-hmm. I'll try to sell it to you. Mm-hmm. We'll see. Uh-huh. Um, I'm old now. I don't know your age. You, you don't have to share your age, but I know you have a couple okay. of uh, children. So 2005 is when you sort of switched to philosophy. So there, yeah. we, can, we can take that yeah. as a, a, a point and start valuing history. And uh, you know, I realize uh, I value history a lot more now than I used to. Uh, for, for instance, when I started out in neuroscience, even, I, you know, history just seemed to get in the way of like what I needed to learn. Why do we not value history much when we're younger or less experienced? Is there just too much other stuff to learn? So it's hard to contextualize any of it at the time and really appreciate it? Or, you know, we're just young and foolish or what? Oh, I don't know, because I I never, I don't re- recall ever not being interested in history. It wasn't a subject that I ever studied full time, but I think I was always interested. But did you always see the, appreciate the relevance? Because it's, it really has shaped mm-hmm. your view. And I, I'm going to, I want to ask you later about how, you know, philosophy has shaped your view of neuroscience, because that changes things. And, you know, so. Yeah. Did I always see the relevance of it? I, I think so even as a neuroscientist. So my um, my advisor when I was doing my PhD was um, Dr. David Tolhurst from the Cambridge um, Department of Physiology, as it was back then. And he always encouraged me to read, you know, papers from the 60s. And he talked about, you know, work that was done in psychophysics back then and how it shaped um, the physiology right. of the early visual system. So definitely... So there was a scientist who, like, in, like, fostered in his own students that you should know about how the field evolved in order to, like, make sense of what's going on in, um, neurophysiology of V1 today. So I think I, and I, I don't remember ever, like, being skeptical about that. <laughs> so I, I think, yeah, yeah, we were just on the same page. Really? I think this is all quite useless. What's this old codger <laughs> getting at? Yeah. My my, po- yeah. my postdoctoral advisor um, Jeff Shaw was also um, really good at that and and pointing in the right ways to the right things that will make you sort of appreciate it in light of what you're doing. So mm-hmm. um, I think it's a valuable exercise. Okay, well, understanding this is the the first thing that I, I want to discuss, um, and we won't even be able to get to you know all of what your what your current work focuses on here today. But understanding as a subject of philosophy of science has really exploded recently, and that may be partly because of the era that we're in, in terms of, you know, building these deep learning models that right. predict really well, but that we don't understand. Mm-hmm. Before we talk about that actual specific predicament, mm-hmm. let's talk about understanding itself, because it sort of underlies the rest of our discussion here, is understanding the central epistemic aim of science and what does that mean? Yeah, so the word epistemic just means related to knowledge. So an epistemic aim of science would be an aim of science in relation to the knowledge um, generation process. So another epistemic aim could be truth. Um, um, people like Angela Potochnik, who, she's a philosopher of science at the University of Cincinnati, she has written a book arguing that the central epistemic aim of science is understanding. One of the reasons she gives for that is that science relies so heavily on idealizations, so representations of nature, which we know from the outset include falsehoods, false descriptions of how things are. So if we say the aim of science, the epistemic aim of science is simply truth, then how do we reconcile that with um, scientists using idealization mm. so often. 
so I, th- I think that's a really important point and it certainly influenced how I'm thinking about these things. But another line of influence in this project and the work I've done on understanding was actually coming from a historian of science, uh, Peter Deer. So um, one of the questions that bothers both historians of science and philosophers of science is, like, what is science, right? So oh, geez. A lot of the philosophy of science, especially in the 20th century, was working at trying to like figure out what's the essence of science, like what is the scientific method. And philosophers went round and round with different proposals and never agreed. Meanwhile, um, science was actually being done in the background. Right. <laughs> sure, sure. But the question like, what is science? It invites, an, you know, an exploration. of Maybe there's one methodology which ties all this together. Um, whereas for historians, they're thinking about like, in terms of, all right, what of all the historical records and um, things that we can investigate as a historian actually delimits the scope of the history of science? So the question is, is science only what scientists do? And then we come into this thing like the word scientist is actually a new word. It comes in in the 19th century. Before that, no one called themselves a scientist. So, but we think of the history of science as going like way back longer than that. Those were natural philosophers, right? Right, right. And then also cross-culturally, I mean, there's, is it, you know, a Eurocentric bias to think of science as something that started in Western Europe and then spread around after that or should we look at research aimed at you know knowledge of nature that was done all across the world by people everywhere and also include that within the scope of the history of science so yeah the question Mm. what is science is something historians also need to think about so there's this paper by peter deer uh, was published in 2005 called what is the history of science the history of and this influenced me a lot because the idea that he comes up with is that what we call modern science since the 17th century is this marriage of natural philosophy, kind of reflection on nature, which aims purely at understanding nature for its own sake, with, if you like, an engineering discipline. So something aiming at control of nature, instrumentality. So if, you know, what we call science is this interplay of like the aim of understanding with the aim of control, then yeah, it makes sense to say that the central epistemic aim is understanding. And then it really resonated with the issues that are coming up in neuroscience, the development of neural networks today that, you know, if this marriage of natural philosophy and instrumentality only happened, you know, a few hundred years ago, and that's what is characteristic of modern science, then that they could there could also be a divorce. Like it doesn't mean that those two tasks of trying to understand nature and also using that understanding to try and control na- control nature always have to be together. Maybe they'll pull apart. Mm-hmm. And so I was looking at you know research in neuroscience in which the the power of the research to give you understanding and the power of the research to allow you to predict and therefore control the brain seems to be coming apart. Oh, good. This is something that I want to ask you about in a few minutes. But you have a particular view on understanding called non-factive understanding. And it made me think of a famous quote uh, about modeling, which uh, you're, this, is, this is what I'm going to pitch to you as a subtitle or maybe a chapter or something in, in your book, uh, in your upcoming book. You want to hear it? Yeah. Okay. Uh, all understanding is wrong, but some is useful. Oh, okay. Well, so that's that sounds that sounds <laughs> on my street. Yeah. Do, uh, so do, but, yeah. Go ahead. So, is this a phrase you've heard elsewhere, or you just came up with this in response? No, to, this is right? a this is a it's a famous um, qu- modeling quote by. Um, uh, oh, box. I'll have to insert the name later. Alfred. Oh, what is his name? I just blanked on his name. But it's all <laughs> models are wrong, but some are useful. Is like sort of the uh, sort of the thing that go to. And and my my take on on non-factive understanding is that oh, that's a sort of a pithy way to uh, 
summarize it. But so so tell us what what is non-fact of understanding and how does it differ from, you know, some of the other uh, accounts that are floating out around there these days? Right, right. Yeah. So the fact of approach to understanding just says that, you know, we understand a phenomenon in nature by way of learning the truth about it, having an explanation of it, which is true. So it puts truth to be a condition on having genuine understanding. Whereas the non-factive approach really takes on board that, you know, the most successful and most useful models in science tend to be highly abstract, like much more simple than the phenomena in nature themselves, idealized and that they include false assumptions. And yet we still think of them as offering understanding. So it just does not put um, truth of the model as a condition on it being able to give you understanding. So it doesn't exclude the I, the exclude truth from an account of understanding, just that it, uh, it, mm -hmm. it reduces the necessity of truth being an account of understanding. Right. And one of the, um, one of the features of the non-factive approaching is it, takes on board that, you know, human beings, um, all scientists are human beings, are, you know, finite beings, we, you know, there's only so much cognitive resources that any one of us can for have now. in any one of our brains, <laughs> for now, for now, we're not dealing with future enhanced science, but for now, and so scientific understanding is a compromise between, like, the overwhelming complexity of the things that are there in nature, especially biological systems and, you know, the human ability to think through a complex system. And so you could think of, um, you can think of non-factive understanding as saying that understanding occurs when you get the right sweet spot between the like really overwhelming complexity that there in nature and the human mind's ability to grasp the interconnections that are there in such a way that it allows some kind of um, ability to deal with that phenomenon, right? To suit, you know, some pragmatic aim that a human would use their science for. And, and you give examples of how, well, you describe how this account of understanding, non-factive understanding, in particular, uh, is a benefit to neuroscience. So how, how does it benefit neuroscience? How does it benefit neuroscience? Well, I um, pitched this as sort of observing that there's a big debate right now amongst neuroscientists about whether like the most advanced state-of-the-art models that we're using to model the brain, so especially when using deep learning, so deep neural networks, recurrent neural networks, um, whether those are interpretable that's the word that often comes up here. The li ph philosophical literature on understanding um, is helpful there, and I've referred in particular to the work of another philosopher of science, Hank Direct, which, um, because philosophers have been thinking about this question of, okay, how does a model give you understanding? And he uses the word intelligibility as being the property of a model. It's a bit like how computer scientists raise the question of interpretability. So mm. it's a question like, you've built this model, mm. it's really complicated, um, is it intelligible to you or not? Um, the link to understanding is that if you have an intelligible model, that affords understanding of the phenomenon in nature. So where I use the word intelligibility, it's a following direct, it's a um, property of the model or theory itself, whereas understanding is like directed to the thing in nature. Yeah, so this question about intelligibility, that um, also has professors in the history of science because one um, realm where it was debated a lot amongst scientists was in um, quantum physics, so quantum mechanics, different, you know, you had um, Schrodinger and Heisenberg and physicists were talking about, well, you know, wave mechanics, it's kind of intelligible, but matrix <laughs> mechanics, that's not intelligible. Where possible, we prefer an intelligible theory. And then thinking about what is it that makes one theory intelligible and the other not. 
So I think all of these um, previous instances of these discussions would be relevant to neuroscience today and also thinking through like philosophically which you know what is it about a model that makes it intelligible to the scientist as the science progresses and the scientists themselves develop their appreciation for different modeling techniques do the models become more intelligible I mean certainly how direct conceives of intelligibility it's a shifting thing it's not you know, something fixed for all times, but to different scientists, one model might be intelligible and to others not because of their background training, background assumptions. Right. Yeah. That's also in the uh, direct, um, it, it has a lot to do with the skill of the researcher in the interpretability. Right. And, right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, just as an aside, what, is is his book, Understanding Scientific Understanding, the, the one, if you had to choose one of the recent handful mm -hmm. that have come out on mm -hmm. understanding um is that the one you would point to or uh, if you had to choose no no i wouldn't want to i just <laughs> oh you can't one and <laughs> say, say, say. okay you can't for can't force you to do anything yeah N no 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 uh i would say yeah that's that's particularly uh useful for looking at these um like i say there's case studies and from the past and um and because his it has a separate feature on intelligibility that's helpful if you're thinking about interpretability. The Potochnik um, book is nice because it there's a lot of discussion about idealization and how that um, mm. links to understanding. So, so those are those are kind of complementary then, right? So, so to make these deep learning models, and I promise we're going to talk about them more in a second mm -hmm. here. But mm -hmm. the idea is you have these super complicated models. And one benefit of non-factive understanding is that you kind of you give up on the idea of understanding them in all their glorious detail, and and you realize we have to abstract, we have to idealize uh, in order to understand, and that's you have to be okay with that, and and then there's a process of actually having to do it, which is another hard thing. Right. Right. Yeah. So. So when I'm talking about understanding there, again, I'm talking about like our understanding of a brain area. So let's, you know, talk about early visual system, V1. Um, so what I'm arguing in my work on, you know, understanding in neuroscience is that we have models which afford us understanding of how simple cells work. But the thing is to be, you know, simple enough to be intelligible to the scientists, then they have to be very abstract, very idealized. So very simplified compared to all of the behavior that a V1 neuron could do, especially if it's stimulated with like all of the scope of stimuli that it would encounter in a natural environment. So in order to say that we understand V1 using those classic intelligible models we have to give up on the idea that those models are like telling us the truth about mm. um how those cells work um one reason to think that they're not giving us the truth about how those cells work is that the current state of the art models which are much more predictively accurate of those cells responses mm. to a, like vastly wider range of stimuli um do not have the same assumptions that these classic models have. They don't assume that those cells are inherently linear computations, and that's probably why they do much better, but the mathematics is opaque, so you're giving up on the intelligibility of the model. So there's this fundamental... Okay, so yeah, we'll bring in the deep learning yeah. models, models now. So there's this fundamental trade-off between prediction and understanding in that sense, and and you suggest that these more classic models, like a simple cell model in V1, actually may provide better understanding, even though they're less accurate and provide right. worse uh, predictions. Mm -hmm. Whereas the opposite would be true for the modern deep learning models that are maybe mm -hmm. more true to the way our brains are processing. And mm -hmm. I just said processing, but that could be a dangerous mm -hmm. word. The brain, right. the way our brains are functioning, you know, whatever word right. you want to enter insert, uh, but drive us further from understanding. 
Mm-hmm. So you you use uh, as examples you use the early visual system and models right. of canonical computations um, mm-hmm. that are proposed some of the earlier models pre deep mm-hmm. learning you know right uh, and you also use examples from the motor system yeah yeah so so the interest in the the V one cases actually stems back to things that I was thinking about and um, bothering me when I was a um, a graduate student in neuroscience. So my task that back then was to um, do psychophysics of contrast discrimination. So my experimental work was the psychophysics. And then we were um, modeling the psychophysical um, data in terms of um, models, which are based on the Gabor model of um, V1 neurons. So it would be... Um, and adding to that, um, he, David Heger's normalization step. So these models tend to p- predicting the psychophysical work, and also when you're looking at big predictions from the neural data themselves, they do well when your stimuli that you're using for contrast discrimination are like Gabor patches right. or maybe a couple of Gabor patches overlaid one or, or another. Um, but one of my, t- the task of my project was to look at, you know, psychophysics of contrast discrimination when you're using natural images oh, no. and, mm-hmm, <laughs> and seeing if the models could, that was still essentially like Gabor models plus normalization, whether they would still, um, would still work. So to, just to paint the picture, the difference between You know, when someone's looking at a natural scene where the entire screen is filled with a picture versus looking at a screen that's all gray, Mm -hmm. except for a small patch in Mm -hmm. on the screen that has these Gabor patches that are black and white, uh, linear black and white uh, back and forth patches. Mm -hmm. That's (laughs) right. Sorry, I just wanted to make sure. Yeah, yeah, sure. So thanks for thanks for tipping in there. Yeah. So one of the things that sort of bugged me back then was it just struck me like the brain is this very, very complicated organ. How could it possibly be that a model as simple as the Gabor model with the normalization stage added, which is not mathematically a particularly complex model, could really be capturing, you know, inherently what these cells are doing. But I was at the same time impressed by Hmm. how far they could go, you know, for most of the psychophysical data that we were using with these Gabor patches and black and white stripy patches. And uh, and I was also impressed by my supervisor, David Tolhurst, you know, like real conviction that as a scientist, what we need to do is try and see how far we can get with the most simple models that we can. Right? Really, he didn't want to give up and try and complexify things more if we could just figure things out with this really quite simple theory really quite simple model of what's going on in v1 and so for a long time i was a sort of believer in the project of finding these canonical neural computations sort of finding fairly simple computational templates which get repeated in different brain areas and afford a um theory of the operation but then with the advent of um, deep learning and finding like a lot of the tasks that were not successfully modeled with the classic uh, approach then became predictively tractable with much more um, mathematically complex models. It made me start thinking, well, maybe my first instinct as a graduate student was right, that those classic models are just like way underestimating what's going on in the brain and mm-hmm. they work as well as they do, because you've basically controlled the stimulation that you're giving the brain so much, only showing it like mostly a gray screen and then this little stripy pattern. And it's really the simplicity that you're introducing as an experimenter by having such a controlled visual input that is the reason why those particular data are predictable using the simple models, but that's not telling you what the brain would do like beyond that range of conditions it's not like revealing some inherent simplicity that's there in the brain in the brain yeah 
so we so then we we have that these differing pictures, right? These very simple models that you used, and and then these really complex models.、Mm-hmm. And there's a divide in that these very simple models might provide great understanding, but don't predict well, at least in the broader scheme.、Mm-hmm. And the, the deep learning models are the opposite of that spectrum.、Right. And one of the、uh, I'm going to be talking with、uh, Jim DeCarlo、mm-hmm. soon. And you're very familiar because you use、um, his line of work often in your work.、Um, yeah, so I would just say I don't use it as one of the main case studies, but yeah. Well, right. So that was going to say because in your work you sort of make an an exception、mm-hmm. to Jim DeCarlo's lab's、uh, work. So the the deep learning models that you talk about as being、um, further from understanding and where the divide is. Being、uh, increased between prediction and understanding, don't take into account anatomical structural、mm-hmm. features. Whereas the models that people like Jim DeCarlo use to model ventral visual stream or or other brain regions that have these hierarchies that are at least somewhat constrained by what we know about the anatomy and the structure of brains,、um, you're careful to say that. That might be somewhat of an exception、uh, mm-hmm. to this, and I don't know. We don't need to get down、yeah. dirty into his models, but how how are those models unique in the prediction versus understanding dilemma?、And、yeah, just... right. Yeah, so I wouldn't say that they're unique.、Um, mm-hmm. So Josh Glazer and his colleagues、um, have a nice paper in the different tasks of using machine learning in neuroscience, and one out of the four that they list is. Using a deep network as a sort of representation of the anatomy of different brain areas, albeit a very schematic and abstract one, but still, you know, a representation of like some of the architecture of the brain.、Mm-hmm. And a second task is using a deep network as a decoder. Right. So my prediction versus understanding trade-off applies to that use of、um, deep networks for decoding. So where where what you're、mm-hmm. trying to do is build an encoding model of like how the world state of the world maps to spikes、um, emitted by particular neurons, and then using that potentially to read off from spike trains what is what that signifies. I see.、Um, for the brain, so that's really a quantitative problem, where what you're trying to figure out is like what is the computation being performed by a particular neuron, say a V1 neuron or a motor cortex neuron,、hmm. and you're using the model to represent the computation done by that neuron. So the you know classic、um, Gabor models that I was talking about, all of the mathematics there, it's It's it's、um, just hand handwritten. It's stuff that you know、right. a person could write down on a blackboard, and it's making this assumption that there's this linear computation that's going on at the heart of those、mm-hmm. systems. In contrast, if you're using、uh, machine learning for that decoding task, you're using the capacity of the net, the artificial network, to be a universal function approximator. So if you just give it enough data, it will learn. A mapping between the input and output,、um, but the mathematics that's going on in the train network is like、um, opaque. It's like it's embedded in the network, so you couldn't just like you've got your train network. You couldn't just write down what the equation is, what the function is that is、right. mapping inputs to outputs in that model. So the point of the trade-off is just saying that、okay, if you your If the thing that you're trying to understand is the computation done by the neurons, taking the deep learning approach is not going to give you understanding, and because the、um, train network is not intelligible.、Um, so in the De Carlo lab, I, what I see going on there is there's stuff on the quantitative side. So some of what they're doing is like building encoding models of ventral stream neurons. But they're also doing some qualitative work, which is like building networks which map on to some of the anatomical features of、um, brain areas. And also, you know, when you see like those receptive field maps that they're giving you of V4 neurons, it's giving you like a qualitative sense of what those neurons might be responding to. But in terms of the
quantitative side, like what is the computation being performed by those neurons? It's not shedding light on that. So I would say some of that trade-off applies there, but it's not like it's everything that is going on in that lab. There's some mix in there. Yeah. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, another reason I brought up uh, Jim is because he has his own take on understanding. Mm -hmm. And um, there's a reason I'm going to ask him about this, but right. um, he sort of redefines it or at least operationalizes it with respect to his models. Um, I don't know if you want to summarize his view or I could, um, mm -hmm. but I, I want to know your take on his operationalization of his control version of understanding, which you mentioned earlier. Maybe you can maybe you can just summarize mm -hmm. it again. Yeah, so the recent paper, I believe it was in Science, so Bashivan was the first author. It's showing how you can train a network to to find a stimulus that will drive ventral stream neurons. Um, yeah, whole as populations. Hard as you can. Yeah, well. all populations yeah. as hard as you can. And that's a really impressive feat. So nothing I'm going to say is to detract from like the <laughs> achievement there. Um, yeah, yeah. It's an impressive study, definitely. Um, what it's showing you there is they found a way utilizing deep learning to really get a control on neural activity that people haven't been able to get through other kinds of technologies. Certainly not like just eyeballing um, neurophysiological results and thinking, yeah, maybe a hand will drive this hard. They've really got a very fine engineering handle on like how to drive these neurons in ways that people haven't had before. And I'll just say that the images that the network generates that drive the neurons the way that, you know, that control the way that the neurons respond are um, really not anything that look natural at all. It's, you mm -hmm. know, it's very specific lines and segments in shapes that you don't recognize as natural at all. You know, it's so it's very, these are very unnatural images, mm -hmm. but yet drive uh, the neurons in a very particular way, more than they would have ever been driven by a natural image, for instance. Yeah. Yeah. So, th so that in itself is interesting that there's something that the network is doing, which is not like where a human being would intuitively go with like, trying to think up what stimulus would drive these neurons. Yeah, so, I mean, it. but talking about the kind of control that this deep learning affords here as just another kind of understanding, I mean, at the end of the day, you know, you can say it's a semantic issue, and if you want to call that understanding, we can just redefine understanding. But... This just seems to be a redefinition to me. It doesn't seem to have anything, um, any relation to like our initial notion of understanding. So one core thing about understanding, like what makes understanding the thing that we value as scientists and as people trying to understand nature is that we would say that there's understanding there when you've taken you know, phenomena, these things that occur in nature, which on the surface of it look really, they really complicated. You don't know what the pattern is or how things relate to each other. And shown that there's like an underlying simplicity, that underlying simplicity might be, you know, one law of nature, which can, which can show you why all of those different phenomena were expected to happen. Mm -hmm to happen or show that like what the underlying pattern is which is giving you all those different phenomena um you're not getting that here so if i would like want to pin my pin my hat to like what's you know the core thing about understanding that if you don't have that you can't say that there's understanding it would be something like that showing what the simplicity is which is tying together all of those different um, complex surface features you know you, you could compare that to a dimensionality reduction I mean this is one of and it you know links to this thing of like understanding being like cutting cutting complexity down into humanly manageable portions so mm -hmm. dimensionality reduction also obviously in neuroscience it's like a thing that's become so important with 
multi-unit recordings because you have, if you're recording 100 neurons at a time, you have this very, very high dimensionality data set. But if, and you know, a human can't visualize, you know, a hundred dimensional space, but if in virtue of how neural responses are correlated, you can bring it down to, um, you know, between down to about 10 dimensions, you can start to get more intuitions of what's going on and certainly like three dimensions for us is optimal so you could like yeah so i i think that it's if unless de carlo can explain how something like that process of Mm. cutting down apparent complexity to some principles or underlying pattern or or doing some kind of showing how things actually fit into an intelligible order then i don't think you can say that there's understanding there. yeah, it's, he, he does use the word understanding in quotes and and also mm-hmm. uh fully recognizes um and always seems to mention that uh his colleagues it's a contentious issue mm-hmm. right, <laughs> with, right. with his colleagues but it made me wonder uh, if there's so so prediction is straightforward something is accurate or inaccurate and if it's inaccurate you can tell exa- you can quantify how inaccurate it is mm-hmm. but things like understanding and explanation is a whole different you know somewhere mm-hmm. between prediction and understanding is explanation and we won't get into that so we can just focus on understanding but it is not particularly well defined and i wonder if it's a problem that so, well, I wouldn't say it's not particularly well defined. What I might say is that maybe there's a typology of understanding that mm-hmm. is needed. And the reason I thought of this is, well, maybe what Jim is talking about, we could just classify as understanding, c- control type understanding, or, you know, so it's, mm-hmm. it's a different thing altogether, but it's among the typology of understanding mm-hmm. because, you know, Hank, Hank Direct has his version uh, and mm-hmm. there, there are the other versions that I, I won't go through, and you have your non-factive understanding, and they're all related and sort of in a big family. But I wonder if it's a problem at all that, you know, with this prediction understanding divide, that prediction is so easy to quantify, and understanding is mm-hmm. not easy to quantify. Will there ever be a benchmark of understanding, for in, for instance? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So how I like to think about that is uh, read an article in the Financial Times while I was preparing one of version of this draft, which was talking about uh, management and how you know a lot of the fashion in management in the last couple of decades went towards you know hard metrics, hard targets. So you know profit per quarter would be an obvious um, hard metric right. there. Yeah. But on the other hand, you have soft metrics, things like, well, how cohesive is this team? How well is this CEO managing to get keep people motivated? And the point of this article was just that like people like hard metrics because you know where you stand with them. They seem like completely they're completely objective in one sense. You can just measure the data and you know whether you're meeting your targets or not. Whereas all of these soft metrics, they're a bit more intangible, a bit more fuzzy. One person would might judge one way whether the target's been met, another might judge it another way. Um, but the point of the article was that just because they're not quantifiable in the same way, it doesn't mean that management should ignore it. In fact, it could be <laughs> really, really crucial to how well yeah. business is functioning. Right. And if you only stick with the hard metrics, then you could have a very dysfunctional organization. And so I think that's something that, you know, neuroscience is now in the position where it needs to start asking itself is that, okay, so there are all these engineering goals, which can be much more easily quantified and measured than these soft metrics like have I figured out the brain yet? Am I really understanding what's going on in this area? But, you know, as a community, does neuroscience want to still care about those soft metrics? And I think, you know, just speaking myself and things I read in neuroscience and talking to neuroscientists, I think most people really care about understanding. It's one of the really 
important intrinsic motivators that people have with doing science is like they want to understand the world. And so it wouldn't be satisfactory just to reduce the soft target to the hard target just because it's more quantifiable and just because it seems like progress is going in that direction because of new to- new tools like deep learning. Yeah, it's, it's so tempting though because it's such a the, the target is so well defined. Whereas in understanding, you don't you can kind of move towards something and it's amorphous, right? <laughs> you know, uh, wh- one of the things that you argue is that so so there's a lot of work these days trying to make artificial networks more intelligible, um, mm-hmm. and you know that's going to continue and and on some level we're going to abstract and idealize and and we will have a better non-factive understanding of artificial networks. But one of the things that you argue is that that is true, uh, but they will likely always be less intelligible than their simpler counterparts that are these very succinct mathematical models of, let's say, a simple cell, for instance. Uh, And in some sense, the simpler models, the simpler accounts will always be preferred in an understanding sense. It, It made me wonder if Despite that, because I agree with that, mm-hmm. but I wondered if in the spectrum, so as intelligibility increases with artificial networks, mm-hmm. is there going to be a right. threshold where it becomes intelligible enough that it's like, oh, that's good enough. You know, even though the simpler models are still more intelligible, will we then switch? Is there a threshold it'll cross and we'll switch and say, okay, now I feel comfortable enough with understanding the model, the the deep learning models. Is that going to happen? <laughs> yeah, I I don't think it's a, a question that has a like straightforward yes and no answers because like what's good enough tends to change from a case by case basis depending on like what the scientist is trying to do in a particular project. Also, you know, right. in terms of pedagogy, like a lot of the training that you get as a neuroscientist is with these classic models in terms of like what is your how are you like led into um i don't want to use the understand word understanding again but how (laughs) how you taught your basic theoretical framework of what's going on in the brain and so i think it will be a really interesting question with you know with as you're saying intelligibility of these um artificial neural networks increases whether that will be able to replace the role that the classic models of the brain have had pedagogically or not like whether you know whether those classic models will go the way of the reflex theory in terms of like the broad framework for how we think that the brain is working that's now like we wouldn't appeal to the reflex theory anymore for that but once upon a time that's was people's like cohesive framework um so maybe there'll be something that comes out of the um of the new generation of models which replaces that but it's it's hard to say and it it's just hard to say i th- yeah i think it's just too soon to say yeah. how this will yeah. go the, there's a recent uh, push that's coming from a, a couple different quarters that says, let's agree we can't understand deep learning models at the level of their internal, all their internal workings. But maybe what we should try to do is understand them in terms of the things that we control when we build them. So the learning algorithm, the architecture, their development, mm-hmm. uh, the objective function. And um, there's something that's is I'm uneasy about there. Like, I don't feel like that's going to be good enough. Do you, are you aware of that? You know, have you, are you familiar with that? Yeah. So, so I just read this paper, this draft paper, Lily Craft Uncording. What does it mean to understand a neural network? Yeah. That's one of them. Yeah. 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 So there again, I mean, it, that is a six, it is a viable option depending on like whether you're happy of narrowing your narrowing down <laughs> what you want to understand. So if you're really hung up on the decoding problem and you really want to know what the mathematical relationship is between world states and spike trains, 
then just saying like, okay, I know the, the training rule for the network or for the brain is not going to cut it there. So I think it definitely, in order to say that that's a satisfactory answer, you really, yeah, you're really giving up on a lot of the questions that traditionally neuroscientists have been bothered by. Yeah, it's, it seems unsatisfactory to me, but, you know, it's progress, I, I suppose. Mm -hmm. I don't know if this is a tangent, but I was just, and when I read that paper, um, what I found I really strongly agreed with was how they put it, you know, what we're learning from the success of deep neural networks in neuroscience and predicting the brain is that, you know, previous attempts of trying to find a simplified representation of the brain in that canonical neural computations project it's just you know showing the limitations of that attempt that you know maybe the brain is just a lot more complicated than right. people had hoped for yeah and um and highlighting that there may be a, a real i don't know if you just said limitation you probably did but a real limitation on the usefulness of those types of models mm -hmm. yeah that's a good point well, one more question for, on understanding in particular. Mm -hmm. uh, do do I understand how to ride a bike? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, one one of the the ways that you can think about, you know, your bike riding knowledge is that it's you know implicit as as a skill. It's not like right. you can just articulate everything that goes into your motor control when you're riding a bike but yeah you can reliably do it and you can adapt to different situations and t you know enough about riding a bike that you could teach someone else to do it I think that's important. <laughs> well i don't know i just taught my my son how and the way i did it is i just pushed him <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> yeah but you, you'd be able to give some tips right no, that's true. But and he he'd already had some training. But the the point is that what I'm wondering about is we have this phenomenon mm -hmm. where when we sort of use something long mm -hmm. enough and get like our familiarity with it increases, we feel we understand it even though we can't articulate it, for instance riding a bike. And I wonder if you can use something into if that sense of understanding is the is the same sense of understanding that we're talking about or where it fits in that scheme. So yeah, no. So, so I thought of another comparison for, for the, um, use of these deep mm -hmm. learning tools, which is more like, I know how to ride a bike. I do it every day, but I can't fix it. So I feel like, you know, where mm. I'd be if I was using these networks in neuroscience, it would be, yeah, I, I know how to get it to do what I want for this task when everything's going well, but I don't know enough about the nuts and bolts not exactly the fixing it task, but like to, you know, my limitations of understanding a bicycle is that I don't yeah. know enough about the mechanisms to be able to fix it. And likewise, you know, with the neural network, I wouldn't know enough about the mechanisms that make it do what it does to be able to say I could, you know, reverse engineer it and fix it. So I, I, I would like that analogy more for neural networks than the mm. implicit knowledge that I have of bike riding myself yeah that's it's interesting i i don't know if it was richard Feynman and uh and maybe surya ganguly's talked about this that th th this conception of uh understanding where wherein you without writing the equations and solving the equations you can think about if you can in the model if you can think mm -hmm. about if you would tweak something how it would change the output that is one sense in which understanding and and in that sense you don't have to fix the model you don't have to uh, engineer it anyway yeah this is all yeah <laughs> yeah that that that's right that, yeah i'm glad you brought that up because that is the notion of um intelligibility of a model which is there in hank direct's theory and it came originally from Feynman used it and there was another physicist before him who first came up with it but it came out of this debate over the interpretability of quantum mechanics. All right. Um, so the brain is a computer, right? Masrita, the, the, the computer <laughs> brain metaphor uh, mm -hmm. that the brain is a computation machine mm -hmm. is under a lot of heat lately, I feel like. But you have a solution that makes everyone 
feel better or potentially could make everyone feel better. Why do we love the computer metaphor for brains? Is it accurate? And if it isn't accurate, how does it benefit neuroscience? Yeah. So can I just say, I'm surprised that you say it's under heat because everything that I've been hearing from neuroscience recently seems to buy into it a lot. Oh, I think that, yeah, I think that you're correct. But mm -hmm. um, I've had people like Paul, Ch <laughs> maybe it's under heat in my mm -hmm. mind, because I've had mm -hmm. people like Paul Chisek on the show. And we talked, he's very anti -com computer oh, metaphor. Okay, I have to listen and, to that episode. Right? Yeah. Okay. And I feel even and, and also your work points to a lot of other people sort of singing the same song that the computer metaphor is is not correct. But but it's I think it's at its peak in computational neuroscience. It's at peak computer metaphor right now. So I, right. you know, maybe it's under a minor amount of heat, <laughs> but but only because it's so accepted and common. I think. Right. Right. Okay. Sure. Yeah. So all right. The first thing I wanted to say to the preface to answering your question is that the work on prediction and understanding sort of assumes the ground truth of the computational approach to the brain. It is taking it for granted that what neurons are doing are computations on inputs coming from the world. So it assumes that there is like a computation that a B1 neuron does and the task of the neuroscientists is to figure out what that is. And and to do so they have to they have to separate it from in the neural activity from all of the other messy stuff, the noise and the and the metabolism and all that stuff that gets in the way, which you, you, you talk about at length as well. So Right, right. Yeah, so in some other papers, I've been looking more critically at the computational framework for understanding the brain. And this, again, was inspired by some things I was reading in the history of science and historians writing about science, which is, okay, like, what is it that scientists are doing when they're trying to understand one kind of thing by drawing analogies with something else? And mm. analogical reasoning seems to be really important throughout the history of science. So think about how, you know, the idea of sound waves can be related to observations of water waves. So there's things that are directly accessible to the human senses like waves in a pond, but there are phenomena which seem to be rely which are relying on things that are beyond our senses, but you know, like sound. But we can scientists have noticed that there are some similarities with the observable phenomenon and the inobservable one. And they by bootstrapping off an analogy, you can start start the beginnings of a theoretical framework for something um, where the mm. working parts are not observable. So I think analogical reasoning is really, really important in science. And I'm also arguing that the computational framework in neuroscience is an instance of analogical reasoning. So my opponent in this project is someone that says, you know, computational neuroscience works because the brain really is a computing machine. It's a machine which, if you like, has been designed by evolution, but it's a computer just as much as your desktop is. It's running it's running algorithms. In one hand, the substrate is non-living tissue, um, and the brain case it's living tissue, but abstract away from the substrate difference, you could they are both computing machines. And that the brains are uh, the, are are trying their best to compute target functions, the very certain functions they're trying to compute. Right. And what I'm arguing in this paper sort of against this literalist approach to understanding what's going on in computational neuroscience and why the computational framework is successful, I'm arguing that, you know, why neuroscientists grasped on the computer approach is that there is a nice analogy that you can draw between brains and computers. And when you're looking at computers, at least until we get to deep neural networks today, computers are much more understandable than brains are. So if what you can do is like draw some comparisons between a 
well understood system and a not well understood system that gives you the beginnings of a theoretical framework just like you know water waves versus sound waves and uh, particular to the neuroscience case what i argue is that using the computer framework it gave you uh, gave neuroscientists an excuse to ignore lots and lots of the messy biological details that are going on in neural tissue so to abstract away from most of the biophysics of the cell and just say okay let's treat a neuron as if it is this input output device which is doing a certain kind of computation then that gives you a principled framework where you abstract away from lots of the biological details and it gives you some explanatory purchase on like plenty of things that we can talk about as successes of computational neuroscience you distinguish between these two approaches and i don't know if how well this actually maps on to what you're just describing as so what you call formal realism mm -hmm. is that you know this idea if we could get rid of all the necessary details uh, the noise and the metabolism and the biophysical properties that you know the brains are trying their hardest to, to perform you know this particular function. And when we make neurocomputational models, the model is modeling the function that the brain is actually really trying to perform, mm -hmm. whereas formal idealism is different. I don't know if you want to just contrast that, contrast these two uh, terms that you've laid out. Yeah. So formal idealism, it's saying that like your abstract model of the neural system is like the lie that reveals the truth. And I get that quotation hmm. from in the Candle and Schwartz um, the neuroscience te textbook. Oh, nice. um, oh wow, you a, read that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, no. I just thought someone else quoted it and then uh, I started using it. But yeah, so there's... there's <laughs> ah, no, no, I would never read the, the, the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> well, no. I, me either, me either. <laughs> time enough, but yeah. Yeah. You know, busy, busy people and there's always... <laughs> So much to yeah. read. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So in the section there on theoretical neurosciences, it talks about modeling as, you know, we know that there's abstraction there. We know that, you know, pyramidal cells are not really triangle shaped and there's more going on in the dendrites than most of our models are ever going to put in there and try and represent. But there's this conviction that what the model is doing is like getting out this underlying computation, which is like, if you like the inherent mathematics that's there in the brain. And in contrast, what I call formal idealism is saying that, you know, science is about simplification, i.e. people coming along and abstracting and sort of massaging things, both by doing the experimental adjustments and then, you know, looking at patterns in the data and sort of discarding some of it as noise, even though, you know, that could be contentious because maybe there's pattern there, which isn't strictly speaking noise, like experimentally introduced noise. It's, but it's pattern mm -hmm. from the brain's perspective and not from the neuroscientist perspective and actually trying to massage out some simple, simpler structure from all of the complexity that's there in the brain as opposed to just saying, you know, coming in with this conviction that, you know, underlying there really is this function being computed and that is there and it's... Like the fun like there's a, a, an ontological status of the function? Is it right to say that? Yeah, yeah, that would yeah. be right. Yeah. So, in, and it's there independently of whether the scientist yeah. represents it in that way or not. Whereas the formal idealist approach is to say, okay, it can be valid and useful to model the system in this way, but we should not assume that the way it's, the properties that we attribute in the model are there in the brain sort of independently of our modeling it in this way. So this is, you know, this is all related and this comes right back to your non-factive understanding mm -hmm, that right. there's this, you know, we can't, it's an idealization and an abstraction and it's there in the word formal idealism. Uh, an abstraction that is uh, necessary, but it's we're not actually the the the, the true thing is maybe beyond our grasp. Mm -hmm. Is that fair to say? 
Yeah, yeah, I I tend to to think that way, and people have called me a pessimist for <laughs> thinking that way. But I would say more of a realist, you know. Going back to where we are as human beings, finite human beings in the world is like far bigger and more unpredictable and more complicated than often we like to appreciate. So, would it be accurate to say that your view, when we're using computational models, uh, to you know, try to get some knowledge, try to understand, uh, you know, the way that some brain area works, that we're not really discovering the mathematical structure of nature so much as we're, I can't directly quote you, but a summary would be that we're, you know, using math, I think you were use the word arduous, to arduously um, <laughs> abstract away and chip away and to know some partial truth of the thing. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, that that's right. I think of, you know, the application of maths to nature as, you know, a simplification rather than, like I said, a revelation of the underlying, you know, structure of the world. And this goes back to, like, one of the oldest issues in philosophy, which is about Platonism. So, and even before Plato, Pythagoras, so two, you know, mm. ancient Greek philosophers and Pythagoras, mm thinking of reality as inherently numbers made of numbers yeah. right so thinking like underlying reality is maths and so much of modern science kind of carries on with that assumption so and hence the belief in like computational models being like the underlying truth of the brain but if you break with that tradition you won't just say no like what reason have we to think that like the metaphysics of the world is actually mathematics as opposed to like the material reality that we have around us and that mathematics is a tool for abstracting away from the complexities of those material realities and it you know allows for prediction and control so it is really helpful for those engineering tasks like that engineering strand which is there running through modern science but it shouldn't then be you know, taken to be like the underlying reality. Isn't mathematics impressive that we could invent such a thing that's not even real? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sure. <laughs> sure, sure. So it's certainly a testament to like the power of the human mind. So like I said, I'm not trying to like discount the achievement. Oh, yeah. No, no, I'm just celebrating yeah. with you our yeah. the, the humanity's achievement of mathematics. And I'm trying to get people to stop calling you a pessimist. You know, I'm on right, your side right. here. So, yeah. Well, Masrita, this has been a lot of fun for me. I really appreciate you okay. spending so much time, and so, um, you know, there's so much more we could have gotten to, and I'll, I'll point to all of the this work. But uh, um, I hope you continue doing what you're doing. I, I really appreciate it. So, thanks for talking. Yeah, really nice to meet you. Brain Inspired is a production of me and you. You can support the show through Patreon for a microscopic two or four dollars per month. Go to braininspired.co and find the red Patreon button there. Your contribution will help sustain and improve the show and prohibit any annoying advertisements like you hear on other shows. To get in touch with me, email paul at braininspired.co. The music you hear is by The New Year. Find them at thenewyear.net. Thanks for your support. See you next time.